Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming to the uh, presentation of Are We Wasting Money on Cyber Security? I hope that's what you know that you're attending. Um, so we've got two fantastic speakers tonight um, and we're going to be having various different um, ways of displaying things. There's presentations, there'll be polls, there'll be questions and answers. Um, I hope that you're um, ready to to participate fully in the polls and the questions. If you've got any questions, um, you can type them in the question box as part of the webinar. Just for your information, we're going to be recording this uh, this session tonight. So I suppose by participating, you're indicating that you're okay with the uh, with the recording. Um, we've got some social media um, tags for you to use if you'd like to um, if you'd like to tweet or mention on LinkedIn that you're here which we'd appreciate. Um, so the first speaker that we've got tonight is, is Andy. So Andy Kinnear is the, from the NHS. Um, instead of telling you about him, because he'll be telling you about himself, I've, what I'm going to read out is a testimonial of Andy from another Andy, Andy Kinnear, who is the ex-CIO of the NHS, who says about Andy, Andy's passion, energy, and determination to deliver for the front line of the NHS are second to none. Couple that with some pretty savvy leadership news and highly enviable technical skills, especially around cyber, then you have yourself one impressive individual. If that's not enough, his straight talking JDI approach and always friendly outgoing personality will definitely convince you. Hashtag class act. So that's who we're hearing from first. So I'm going to just hand over to Andy and um, and he's going to get going. So Andy. Okay, so uh, I wish I was Andy Kinnear. Um, he's obviously uh, better looking than I am, but don't tell him that. Um, I'm Andy Evans, so uh, hopefully in a second you will see my screen. Don't you just love these things where everything works terribly poorly? So here we go. It, One second. There we go. It's there we go. Up. Oh, yeah, it's popped up now. Yeah, it's popped up. So hopefully now you can see my screen. Um, it is very daunting, isn't it, everybody? And I'm sure you think the same having done these things. Um, I'm used to going on stage and making the first joke and nobody laughing. Um, but in this environment, I don't even know whether people are not laughing or whether just because everybody's on mute, um, that, that it's really quiet. So I'm hoping that, um, I'm hoping that you enjoy uh, the talk. Um, it is the evening, we're all very busy professionals, I'm sure of that. Uh, so I'm gonna try and make it a little bit entertaining, a little bit interesting. There'll be some stuff in there that might be a little bit, um, provoking and I think that's uh, uh, I think that's really what I was after trying to get people maybe thinking in slightly different ways about um, some of the thoughts that, that I've had on this topic um, and, and the topic is are, are we wasting money on cyber controls um, and David and I who uh, Dr David Day who's on next um, uh, who's got a better microphone than me um, uh, we, we've spoken quite a bit about whether um, Cybersecurity is a waste of money. That was where it started, but I sort of refined it down to a little bit about cyber controls. And hopefully um, you'll sort of understand what I'm saying uh, as we go through it. So thank you for joining this evening. I better get the um I better get the uh, disclaimer bit out of the way. Um, my views this evening are my views, they're not of my employer. Um, should my employer be my employer tomorrow? Uh, they're also not uh, of my previous employer. Um, I've made every attempt to make sure that um, uh, the images I've used and everything that I've displayed is copyright free um, or I'm within the license. So, a little bit about me. So, I don't know how many of you actually saw the picture that was on the BCS uh, flyer for this. Um, I did look like um, uh, I thought that I was a, a boy band member looking, gazing into the distance. Um, 
that was on purpose, believe it or not. I'm not having a midlife crisis. Well, my wife thinks I am, but not, not in this particular case. Um, I will come back to why that is a soft focus, silly picture of a middle-aged man. Um, when I was a lad, um, when I started in computing, 16K was an upgrade. And I suspect there's some of you out there who actually uh, remember those days. Um, 16K was an upgrade. Um, uh, as I sort of worked through the usual uh, uh, development and learning, um, I, I was what you would nowadays dis probably describe as a Windows NT tin hugger. Um, I did such amazing feats as MCSE. Um, I was uh, a Microsoft AD design architect, I think is the appropriate term. I can't even remember that far back. Uh, but my interest has also always been in computer science and psychology and how user interaction and those kind of things um, sort of play a part in, in computing. Um, most recently, I've looked at um, transformation and digital transformation, integration, interoperability between health and social care and uh, third sector to housing those kind of systems to support improvements in care that we're delivering across Nottingham and Nottinghamshire. Um, and I am still working on my cycling proficiency, uh, but I do hope uh, I'll complete it this year. So the stupid picture. So if I was going to my IT supplier and saying, okay, so I want a picture for an event. The usual response would be, here's a picture, Andy, take it from a camera, take it from a phone, there you go. But actually, as a user, I don't, I don't recognise the risk and the threat that that brings to me. I don't realise that in the architecture of that system is the EXIF information, which identifies where I am, what I'm doing, what my phone is, can give all sorts of information away. I also don't recognise that the imaging recognition software, which is freely available these days, might also start to identify me and present a risk to me. And we'll come back to that again a little bit later. So. Um, what I was thinking was, what are we going to explore? How can I get across to you what's shaped my presentation today? Let's have a look at constant improvement cycles, threats as well as prevention, so good as well as bad. And what can engineering in the NHS teach us? And I did say, yes, I did say in a cybersecurity presentation that the NHS can teach us something. And I honestly believe it can. So then we'll have a quick look at enterprise architecture and what design considerations we, we, we think of here and now and, and understand maybe or discuss and debate whether existing standards and models measure up to the new world. And then we'll try and close with, with what next. So just so that we can all relax, um, let's get to know each other a little bit and we're going to try our first poll. So. This is the first test for everybody. And there is an element of nervousness, if I'm honest, in, in how well this will go. So right now, we should be asking the first poll, which is, what would you describe as your current job's main focus? So, oh, look, it pops up brilliantly. So if you could go and answer that. Now, each time there's a poll, and there's a few as we go through, I'd appreciate if you can answer it, but I understand if there's any reasons why you would rather not. Um, on each one, I've just to sort of try and help the time pass by, I've added some little sort of did you know type, uh, cybersecurity, IT type facts and figures. Um, the first one will give you an idea of my sense of humor, um, because I, I do fear that, um, in the interest of sales, an awful lot of uh, cyber information is scare tactics and lots and lots of numbers, which we become quite immune to in time. But as you know, there are hundred percent of cyber scare statistics contain numbers. So how are we doing with the poll? Can I tell from here? You can, it's 88% of people have voted. Okay, brilliant. Well, that's really good. Thank you very much for that. I really appreciate it. Um, so I will keep moving along. Okay, yeah, so this is the point at which probably the number of people attending drops significantly. Um, my thinking on security starts with cavemen, and that might sound a little strange, but bear with me. So it all started with the caveman. Oh, I've suddenly popped up in video. I don't know why that was. Um, can you see me on the video there as well? Or no, can you we see can't my screen see still? I can see your oh, screen. Oh, that's good, yeah. 
Thank yeah. goodness for that. Yeah. Um, so I've closed the poll. That's, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Um, so, so the cavemen. Um, they, in our terms, they had simple business processes. They needed high availability and high reliability because if they don't go and get food, they don't go and get water, they die. So every day the caveman would go out and hopefully he'd find a big woolly mammoth and he would trap said woolly mammoth, slaughter it kindly and take it back to the cave, put it in the cave, preparing for winter when difficult times would come. And then the next day, you would hopefully go out and try and capture another one. Unfortunately, there were threat actors even in those days. And sometimes he'd get back to the cave and someone would have stolen all the woolly mammoth or they would have hacked bits off. Storage was very important to it. So he needed a secure solution. So how could he manage it? What was the problem? So what he did was he got two more cavemen to mine the cave. The only downside to that was every time he went out to get woolly mammoth, he had to pay those with some of the woolly mammoth and that meant he had to work much harder. Not only that, sometimes they were insider threats, as cavemen called it, and they would steal or hack off bits of his woolly mammoth. Not making sense? So I know, I know this is a bit crazy, but let's try another example of what my thinking was. The creation of the wheel came from the Neanderthal man. And believe it or not, it is linked to enterprise architecture. So if you're a young middle-aged kind of guy like myself, um, you were in the era of the hot hatch, the, fast, the first performance cars. And these cars were undoubtedly a very quick car, the MG Montego Turbo, I think you believe me or not. Um, but they were a target for threat actors. There were a number of vulnerabilities discovered and actually they were very quickly exploited they were easily exploited. So not only they were they a target for a professional car thief, uh, in the Midlands certainly, the, what we call twockers, the taken without owner's consent, that was the charge they always got, um, were there the, the, the 80s, 90s version of script kiddies. Um, and they exploited these vulnerabilities, some of which were described as a two-year-old could open one of these with a two-pence piece. Um, they exploited these and quite often, unfortunately, someone's prized possession ended up either on fire, on a trailer or in a scrapyard. So what do we do? So the manufacturer obviously thought about this and decided, do we do a patch? Do we improve the security vulnerability of these? Or do we introduce some security controls? Well. Fortunately, along came, as part of threat reduction and mitigation, uh, a metal bar. So some, some of these were known as crook locks. Other manufacturers, of course, were, uh, were available. Uh, and actually, this was a really successful uh, anti-theft device. It used to hook under the brake pedal and around the steering wheel. Well, we all know threat actors are very agile and very innovative. So when 16-year-olds eventually worked out that they could bend the brake pedal up and then helpfully use the crook, use the, uh, crook lock uh, as a device in which to break the steering lock, which actually made it far more effective to steal the car. So problem with the security control, what do you do? Do you fix the dodgy locks or do you introduce another control? Now, these disc locks were amazing. In fact, I had one uh, very, very 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 good security device in fact even if you owned one and it was your car the time it took to uh, actually start the vehicle with after taking one of these off uh, made it so you didn't even want to go out yourself so the the control was very secure but it was maybe a little unsightly and a little difficult for the user so when we think about these as examples what happened to that business what happened to the reputation of that car manufacturer? So let's try another poll. This one is a little bit more in our field. I'm hoping that you might just recognize this one a bit more in our, in our professional world. So have you ever worked in an organization that's had additional IT systems, actually a bit like the crook lock and the disc lock? So there was a problem because of the problem we have to put in controls 
to mitigate the problem. And while you're opening up the poll and voting, um, a little bit more serious, obviously I work in public sector um, across health and social care. Um, in 1819, local authorities were attacked 78 million times. Um, that's increased sort of, in, in health, the attacks have increased 300% May on May uh, during COVID. Um, across the UK and Europe, health is now 16 to 18% of all data breaches. Um, and these numbers don't really mean anything unless you are one of those people who are looked after by the local authority when they cannot find um, who they are supposed to be safeguarding, or if two and a half years later they're not still not being able to get their data back. So these are big things. So constant improvement. I suspect a lot of you have come across an organisation where enterprise architecture starts with the chief exec going to a show. They really like what they've seen. It's really pretty. It does everything that we need and the world is going to be perfect. Let's put it in. Um, that, of course, as we know, isn't enterprise architecture. Um, not only that, when we end up having to buy the colander, I mean, the new system that might have some leaks, um, in order to rectify that, we have to introduce additional controls. And actually, unfortunately, in professional business, we have those governance arrangements whereby we have to go through the governance group, we have to go through the finance group. Threat actors don't. So they've, they still outstrip us for agility and ingenuity. Prevention is hard. It's much harder to stop someone throwing a brick through the car window than it is to throw a brick through the car window. Enterprise architecture in terms of design life cycle is very complicated. Nobody starts or very few people actually start from a greenfield site. And in the NHS, it is primarily driven by what system you get or what system you've got through a procurement. And all business is complicated in terms of design. The, the balance between the customer, secure, the customer convenience and having a secure system that mitigates the risks, very difficult. And, and, and Apple have done incredible things in moving us forward in the consumer market. But how many of your users come to you and say, I just want something as easy to use as that? They are the challenges that you face and know better than I do. So what can engineering teach us in moving forward and being able to improve our security as part of our enterprise architecture? Well, there are some fantastic frameworks. Uh, TOGAF um, has been around for a long time. It's fantastic, it brings a huge amount of things together. Zachman framework started to bring all these different things together along with TOGAF. And recently I was lucky enough to do uh, um, SABSA, which I really like, um, again, it isn't a single thing along the lines of the IEEE. It brings a number of different things together. Do you know what? Even the government design principles, and I don't know if you can see that, the detail with it. I, I couldn't find anywhere where, where the design principle was chief exec goes to, le uh, goes to presentation and by system. So I recognize and suspect you, you, you live the pain of not being able to do what you actually want to do as an enterprise architect, which is truly build an enterprise environment that meets your users' needs. Actually, this current way is very difficult. So I like SABSA. I really do like SABSA. I think it's a, it's, it's a very good framework. Um, and I think it's focus not on systems, but on risk transition of risk between risk uh, security domains and the fact that it is not just about technology it includes that whole people process um, technology piece um, I really like and, and actually I think the ability to have an assessment based on risk that means we do the right level of security and no more it's really important because all too often what we have to do is apply a, a uniform level of um, of security and, uh, and control, um, which means we overspend on those low risk items and we underspend on the others. But, okay, so engineering's got an awful lot and I suspect you know more about those frameworks than I do. But I did say the NHS can teach us about enterprise architecture and cyber defense. And yes, that is the NHS that suffered 
like many others, um, as a result of the uh, WannaCry uh, decryptor uh, worm. And unfortunately, what, what happened was when, when we reviewed um, the impact, um, the fact that a lot of organizations just turned off, pulled up the drawbridge, stopped connecting, in actually what is quite a connected world, if you are a lab, you send those lab results to doctors. If you are a hospital, you send those discharges to doctors. If you are a doctor, you send referrals. So suddenly pulling up the drawbridge and stopping that really impacted on the business. But because it's a binary response, I don't want to get infected. The only defense I've got is to turn it off. That made it very difficult for organizations to control and manage. But what we can learn from the NHS is the NHS looks after the human body. And the human body is a phenomenal cyber defense. So the human body has a firewall, skin. And within the firewall, it even has intrusion detection. Um, and actually, if, you know, if you've ever been stung by a nettle, you understand that, that's the histamine level, uh, the histamine layer that sits in your tissue. But the human body is built to be breached. The human body knows that because we have eyes, ears, mouth, nose, we do bleed, firewalls will be breached, the skin will be cut. Actually, we know and the human body is designed to be tolerant to being infected, to being attacked. And actually, it's an incredible machine. So the immune system in the human body is built to defend the organs in an order, the brain and the heart being the most important. So when it is breached, the first thing that happens is the white cells, neutrophil, will identify that that digital signature of that cell is not right. And I say digital because the body identifies the cell by its DNA and it recognizes that that doesn't, that doesn't belong to me. So very quickly, the neutrophil, the white cells, will surround and contain the infection. But that isn't the end of it. So if, if the containment fails and the cells continue to replicate faster than the white cells can contain it, actually the body then raises the temperature. It raises the temperature because it knows that cells will die quicker in higher temperature. So it's a second approach to reducing the spread of the virus. And all the time the body will contain and protect its major important organs. But not only that, it also recognizes patterns. It recognizes a virus. It recognizes an infection. And actually that's when it will use its antibodies. Soldiers, as I describe it to my children, um, lymphocytes is how a doctor would probably describe it. And these, these soldiers are the weapons that destroy the infection. And if it recognizes it, instantly it will start to attack those. And then when you get that horrible feeling in your bones and you ache, when you're really poorly, actually that's your stem cell production producing huge amounts of the right cells so that your body can produce those cells to fight the infection. And even if it doesn't recognize the pattern, it will start with the pattern it's got closest and work with the white cells to try and shut down and contain it. Some cells, it will puncture. Other cells, it will try and infiltrate and destroy from the inside. And again, when things still don't work out, the human body will sacrifice parts of the body in order to save the most important system. This defense is obviously part of what got that Neanderthal man this far. So this is the same defense we've had all along. This is a defense that works really well because it's expecting to be breached. And obviously the thing that we all know at the moment, the thing that is of grave concern to everyone is the COVID-19 virus. Just think about the description I've given of how the immune system works and think of what's, what's happening in terms of that management. The reason it infects lungs, the reason you get a, a, a sort of runny nose at time is because the virus will work around your body looking for a weak point that it can attack. And in a lot of, weak, in a lot of parts of your body, you have very strong defense, which is why it ends up in places like the lungs, why it ends up in places like the nasal system, because they are the areas where we have weaker defense. So thinking about that, okay, if we design enterprise architecture with failure in mind, what does it look like? 
So I don't know if anyone recognizes the cell on the left. That, that's a coronavirus the COVID cell. Um, you see the spikes on it, that's designed to destroy the white cells um, that will try and contain it. Um, so you can see we really are talking about a little war. But actually, if you think about how the human body works, it, it creates a gap between the infection and the most important organs, wherever it can. And actually, what it does is it uses its soldiers, its lymphocytes, to try and kill and poison and destroy in any way that it's learned to do. And it will continue to evolve. It will continue automatically within our bodies, without us even thinking, to evolve and try different things to see what can contain it. And it will even raise the temperature of the body to a point where it will put us at risk to try and destroy the infection as a last resort. And the body will even destroy itself in the end, unfortunately. Um, but what if we treated enterprise architects like this? What if we looked at data at the cellular level? What if we looked at protecting the individual data? What if we poisoned our own data so that if someone took it, it would be useless? And I know there's lots of conversations going on about this and AI at the moment about how, how that's an attack, but actually what if it's a defense? What if what if we actually expected to be breached? So anatomy, and before you get too carried away or too worried, this is not uh, a biology lesson uh, from your senior school. It's not even called senior school these days, is it? Sort of year seven on, or upwards, I think. Uh, this is not that kind of anatomy lesson. But what the NHS can teach us is about the threat and how that threat manifests itself and how we might in design be able to mitigate that, manage it and reduce it without adding things at the end. So uh, during the last few months, as I said uh, in the earlier slide, increases uh, in attacks on the NHS have increased sort of 300 plus percent. Um, David later is going to tell you about how some of those attacks end up in different businesses and how some of these weaknesses um, even with defence controls can actually um, still fall apart. So if the, 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 the graph I'm showing there shows the threat breakdown, and this is from a website called Okay, um, there are several of these, it's a free website that, you know, there are several of these just that I personally like, like, like this one for certain things. I think it's very effective in visualising some of the threats. Um, what I learned from this, as you can see in the threat trends, is even hackers like a bit of time off at the weekend. So you can see that the activity drops on a Sunday because they probably have a day in bed. Um, but actually, when we look at the threat breakdown in the last hour, watching the anatomy of the attacks leading up to the bank holidays since March, uh, what we see is a very pronounced pattern. What we see is phishing is the initial uh, attack of, of choice, followed by spear phishing. Um, and then we see malware activity uh, uh, raised significantly and, and, and it was that pronounced that literally on a Friday night at sort of like eight o'clock you could watch uh, and one would swap from the other. The most significant percentage would go from phishing to malware, from malware to command and control. And you can see from the images I've put up there, you can see that these things fluctuate up and down um, uh, and over a longer period they, they're quite significant. So poll time again. Looking at, do we think the existing standards that we work to and the frameworks, which are brilliant, but do we think they require, do they think they cover the all aspects of our enterprise architecture now? And by that, what I mean is the threats are no longer just about the IT that we're building, the people process, the partners and technology, thinking about supply chain and those kind of things. They all represent threats and problems that we need to manage in design of systems. So uh, while the poll goes on, I will uh, just tell you a, a little story. So uh, the, the did you know on there um, outlines some interesting information I came across recently. 20.4 of the 60 billion Internet of um, Things devices have already been exploited or are exploitable. Um, I have some home CCTV um, and uh, I've always been a little bit suspicious of it, so I never really connected to the internet. So just for fun, um, and because I'm a bit of a sad geek, um, 
I used the tool called Root Exploit. I suspect many of you sort of come across it just to see what was happening in my own device. And sure enough, there were 10 um, root and admin accounts in there I knew nothing about. And they obviously have a good sense of humor because the password to one of the root shell uh, logons was top secret. So I admire them for having a little bit of a, a little bit of um, uh, humor in the work that they do. But this, the, the, the image on the screen, um, I, I literally just went on the other day and, uh, and, and just looked for on Showdown and just looked um, for, for a graphic that would demonstrate my point. Um, imagine an SMB1 storage device connected to CCTV being present internet facing. Um, if that is not bait, I don't know what is, especially given the amount of automated scanning that we face these days and the fact that the skiddies, the, you know, the, the, the script kiddies as, as, as such, um, have tools at their hands that in the 1980s when my 16K was an upgrade would have been considered out of this world. And this is the new type of risk that we're facing. This is the scale of the risk that we're facing. This is the attack surface that we're facing. So when we look at enterprise architecture, what are the design considerations? And I've got a couple of sort of older um, graphics on here. Uh, one of which is, I'm sure you'll recognize, it, it is still a framework which is very valid and still underpins an awful lot of other sort of um, manifestations. I had to put in the one that was about electrical machine design because, it, you know, Computing wasn't even a proper term at that point. Um, and the fact that it said Fortran, I, I felt a little bit as I had an, a, sort of a, an attachment to the good old days of, of Fortran and uh, COBOL and other such um, monumentally complex coding languages. But joking aside, do we, when we look at enterprise architecture, do we consider the risk and threat fully in how we design it? Coming back to from the data layer all the way down, do we consider how we protect each element and do we consider how risk affects the solutions we put in to address that business risk? And do we get the business to tell us how often they want to be hacked. Recently I did a piece of work and I'm sort of looking at using some of the lessons I learned in the in the SABSA uh, uh, education I did recently along with other stuff that I've done. Um, ha having used several frameworks over the years I have my favorites as we all do but trying to look at those and, and sort of bring them into a position where the business understands what we're saying and unfortunately I think we create a language that is very technical and I again I liken it to the NHS. Doctors like to talk in medical language. It gives us a professional persona, but also it means that we own the problem. And I think as we um, as we move forward, we've got to stop IT being responsible for security. So I, I presented to a, uh, a board recently um, a paper in which I've sort of set out a definition of what I would consider their risk. And the risk, as I presented it to them, was what? how often do you want to get hacked? Uh, once a year, once every three years, once a week. And how bad do you want that hack to be? Do you want to lose all your data? Do you want to lose one record or all flavors in between? And of course, they were horrified. No, we want a system that isn't going to be breached. OK. So this business need to understand that no matter what we do, there will always be risk. Every system, unless it's turned off and buried in a vault, has its weakness. And all too often that weakness is nothing to do with the technology. I, I have to put this slide up. I love this slide. So those of you who've probably not seen it, I suspect many have, uh, in the States, well in this country as well for a little while, um, there was a spate of uh, roadside um, signage uh, hacking um, and there were some brilliant comments this is a clean one um, I didn't dare put the other ones up for uh, for fear of upsetting the BCS um, but if we look at what is our what is our threat attack surface what is our what is the most common threat vector um, and if we know how these threats start so as I've said we know the anatomy we know how these things work we know how we know what to expect 
they will change because remember, they may very well go from crook lock to disc lock. But actually, we've got a good idea right now, and they're quite consistent. Credential stuffing is the new twist, but they're sticking with that one for a while. And David will explain uh, in more detail and greater experience some of those kind of things in his talk. But the primary attack surface is still the user. I haven't even got an updated figure. But it's a huge percentage. It's the norm to actually not try and break in not to try and come in from the outside, you come from the inside out. So given that as the primary attack surface, how much do we spend on cyber controls in educating our users, getting them to become our skin, to become a histamine reaction that actually really looks out and is rewarded for seeing risk? Do our existing models for enterprise architecture consider the user as a risk? In these days of still using passwords, um, do we? what kind of defense would you think that is? I'm not psychic, but I would walk up to most people on the street and say, I, I can guess the first and last character of your password. Uh, first, like, first character is a capital letter, last one is a number. And I wonder how many we'd get. If you ever get a chance, have a look at the top million most common uh, password list. Um, who knew Liverpool had so many fans? But do our existing models allow for a breach? Do, do we have containment? Can we survive it? Can we keep going? Can we keep the major organs of our business going? And the event of a data loss, how do we reduce the impact? So encryption, fabulous. Doesn't work so well so far. The Wattpad breach the other day seems to have, um, seems to have come uh, from nowhere again, uh, another example of 298 million stolen creds, uh, stolen records, um, and they're offering the hashes and bcrypt keys. So how well does that encryption work? So there's something not quite right. We're still missing something is what I would perhaps say to you. So this is an interesting poll. <laughs> um, uh, I'm hoping people will answer, uh, and I, you know, um, I, I'm just going to check with my colleagues to make sure that you know these answers are not attributable. So th there's there's no way of being able to recognise in the output who has said which answer. It just confirmed that's correct, isn't it? Is that's there? correct, Andy. So, so I, I recognise that you might not want to answer um, this question for obvious reasons, uh, but but it would be interesting. And the information that we've got from the polls as we go through today, the ambition is to uh, discuss this at the end and, and and try and between us in the question and answer session to try and sort of understand what what our opinions are, what the learning is, how that might make me look like a fool who talks about cavemen on an IT presentation um, or actually how we as a body of professionals are facing some challenges. So that the, the, the slide, the picture on the slide, that's a robot that does uh, heart surgery. Uh, that's real. Uh, during COVID, robots were used several times in the NHS uh, because people were unable to travel. Someone from the States, a, a specialist, uh, was unable to travel and actually did the operation from America. Um, Imagine the reliability and security we need to get on that. You don't want a DDoS from some script kiddie um, using the low orbital ion cannon um, from his home PC um, in the middle of that. But is that the same security that we would apply to um, a car park entry system? So we need to start thinking in our enterprise architecture how we survive a breach, an attack, and make sure that our essential systems keep going. The concept of things going from the outside and breaking in is, for me, a, a thing of the past. So every three seconds in the UK um, during the COVID period, May, the Regional Organised Crime Unit gave me this figure that um, an identity is stolen every three seconds. So we've, those people have already got the keys to the door. 
um, and, and I like Bruce Schneier. He's a great guy from the States, never met him. I, I would like to um, do some fantastic talks and uh, I've credited him as you can see here. Uh, he's been credited many times with this, com with this comment. You know, uh, amateurs hack systems, these people who now are our adversary, adversaries are to be respected. Um, they are professionals um, and they don't try and break in through the front door um they will use a set of very advanced techniques to get what they want and we need to make sure that we're giving them the respect but again the human is the weak point how much do we consider the human in our enterprise architecture when we're doing user-based design and we want to make it easy for them and we recognize that ease of use and consumerization has made big changes um but how do we protect them in the same way um without making it all about an IT thing, without making it impossible to use, without driving shadow IT more and more into the background? How do we build a system that's easy for users when the risk is low, but very, very controlled when we get into a higher risk situation? And do we do we have those frameworks and systems that can support that right now? So, if there's anybody left, if anybody stayed on the uh, on the webinar after the um, caveman and the car thefts, um, then I'm really pleased. Thank you very much for listening. So, sort of reflecting, the caveman had fantastic security. As a human being, he had what we now have inherited. And that system's continued to improve, develop over and over. Understanding that it's gonna be breached, understanding there's gonna be problems, understanding that it's gonna to have to adapt. And some have fallen by the wayside, but actually we've inherited that learning. Cars these days are still stolen. IT systems are still breached, um, but it's much harder much much harder and actually if we start to think about how immunology and the human body and what we can learn from this different way of thinking and how that might reflect in our enterprise architecture and how we might use that architecture given that we all have the chief exec going to the conference problem um, and that's an issue in itself getting them to own the risk of when it happens and how big it is is a big problem and if you have the solution please let me know um poisoning our data is relatively straightforward making it useless i've recently been doing some research and i'm trying to drag david into it at the moment um if there are a thousand andy evans's which one am i the where's wally approach to poisoning my own identity online making it difficult to see my picture and use automated systems to recognize it removing exif those kind of things are me introducing a gap, poisoning my own data. So given all my meandering talk, if any of it has made sense to you, um, maybe consider, so the way we do it at the minute, are we wasting money on cyber controls? Or do we just build a door? So thank you very much. I hope that was uh, made sense. Um, and was some interest to some of you got some of you thinking differently so I think we're gonna have a we're having a short question session question and answer session now and then we'll move into David um, talking not about uh, cavemen I think thank you Andy, that's a very useful presentation so uh, open to the question and answer session is open to our audience uh, if you can uh, put your questions in chat window or raise a hand uh, so far, we don't have any questions, but there was a general comment from Dr. Fahid Hanit. Uh, we have considered known vulnerabilities, but with the zero-day vulnerabilities, it will be difficult. So it's a general comment to say the zero-day vulnerabilities may be introduced additional complexity from a cybersecurity. Andy, any comments on that one? Yeah, and I think this is, I, I completely agree, you can't predict the unpredicted, which is why I suppose what I'm saying is, expect that someone's going to break in uh, you know how, how you defend in your infrastructure beyond that is is the bit i think that we don't we 
perhaps don't consider in in the way that we should so if i plan in my architecture that you are going to be in my organization and on my network then that puts us in a different context as to how we design it simple things at the moment that we use quite a lot like honey traps and those kind of things um, to actually lure people and bring them out so we can identify them but also if we design our data and some of this is possible and some of it's not but if we design our data not just with encryption um, but also with algorithms to pollute it um, then actually even when the data's gone the impact is far less for the business uh, and I don't have the answer if I'm honest, <laughs> otherwise I'd have tried to sell it to the security companies and made loads of money. Um, but I think, you know, it for me, it's about getting people, you know, starting to think differently to the, we'll keep them out always. Because as, as, as that person said, you can never allow for the, what we don't know. Okay. Uh, so thank you. Uh, are there any more questions from the audience? So I don't, don't see any. Uh... Okay, so one has just come. Uh, since all the COTS product across enterprise architecture are inherently secure by design, does that mean we have built the door? Uh, so I think it's possibly mentioning that uh, we can we consider all the product COTS products, so commercial off the shelf, uh, which are used in enterprise architecture as secure by design. Uh, they are typically third party taken from suppliers. Uh, so does it not imply we have sufficient security in the enterprise by using those Scots product? What is your view on that, Andy? Um, I, I, I understand exactly what uh, uh, what that person's saying. I, I complete, completely get that. Um, I think, I suppose that the, the problem for me is it's almost been answered by the, the, the previous person um, who, who commented. Um, how, how do you allow for the, I buy it today, it's safe and secure, like the MG Metro, MG Montego Turbo, I buy it today, it's safe and secure. Suddenly it's not safe and secure and I've been, I've been compromised. So, so I suppose the point that I'm sort of suggesting and considering that we sort of debate and have discourse on is if, if we have been breached, how, how well does your system contain the risk? Mm -hmm. Things will continue to change over time. There's, you know, there's, these, uh, if you'd have bought a Range Rover a few months ago, you'd probably thought it was a very secure car or a Mercedes. Awful lot of security devices on it. Uh, now with a, a device, a 50 pound RFID repeater from Amazon, um, not so much. Okay. Uh, another one question from Ben Banks. Threat modeling is hard in an EA framework, especially if you try to link it to financial impact. And uh, if you link it to financial impact, probably you can make it to the execs and boards to listen to you. Uh, I mean, how, how do we solve that problem, especially threat modeling towards a financial impact? I mean, it seems to be very hard or is yeah. a direct linkage possible or what parameter should we use? I, I mean, I, th I th I think, uh, I think that the person who raised that is absolutely spot on. It is. It's incredibly difficult because it's such a dynamic and fluid um, attack surface, uh, you know, all the time. Um, uh, th yeah, th th this almost sort of validates, I suppose, what I'm thinking is because uh, that because that is so difficult, you 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 have to prepare. In my thinking, you have to prepare for for a breach and how you contain the breach rather than can you stop it. Um, hopefully, the way that we design things will stop it. The, the the other bit I would say, and I know David wants to have sort of have a comment about the zero uh, the zero day point. But the, the the bit I would say is, we think about the money we spend on uh, cybersecurity, um, where we worry about a system, so we have to put additional layers of containment and control in it. How, how much do we spend on educating and supporting our users? The 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 self destruct button for uh, NASA's spacecraft doesn't even have a password but the people and process parts of that consideration means it's in the middle of an army base so it isn't always just about our technology you know we as professional technologists can only do what we can do but what we should be more honest about I think is accepting that there will always be a breach and the business owns that problem because it's not our business it's theirs so Dave, I think David might want to sort of chip in. I'm happy for you to chip in, David. If you want. I don't know. Can you hear me? Yeah. Am I audible? 
Okay. All right. yeah. I, I swapped mics actually during your presentation and I wasn't sure whether it was going to work or not. Now, I was just going to make a very quick point on the zero day comment that was made. Um, so, so that, you know, making it more difficult. I mean, it, you know, agreed, yes, more difficult, impossible, no. Now, um, you know, Andy's talked uh, about people and process, uh, which I completely agree with, by the way, in terms of being a sort of a first port of call in making sure that you're secure. Breaches are going to happen. You're not going to be able to prevent them from happening. But if we just, if, if I just sort of take the zero day comment on a on a on a technical perspective, if I can, then um, you know there's there's two things to think about, isn't there, with the breach? There's the vulnerability itself that's being compromised, and then there's the payload which is being used to exploit that vulnerability to to launch a shell or to copy files or to install ransomware. Now, when, when we're talking about zero day attacks, we're not talking about impossible to prevent attacks. We're talking about attacks where the vulnerability on a system isn't known about at that time. That doesn't mean that the payload that's being delivered is known about. So, so you know, when people are writing signatures to detect uh, malware, you know, they're not just writing to detect the patterns, the packets, you know, that, that are, that are traversing the network that trigger the vulnerability. They're also writing signatures to detect that payload that sits within that attack as well. Um, so, you know, the, the, the whole sort of zero day thing, and, and, and even then, you know, with that particular payload, even that might be new and never seen before, but they have similar characteristics. They all look the same in some ways. And, and I did some work on this a, a while back um, at, at the university, and we, 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 we trained some artificial neural nets to, to detect these um these payloads and um you know and, and learn what characteristics of malware look like so so there's still things that can be done uh you know uh, although the bad guys now encrypting those payloads and and not releasing them until they hit a certain known target and that's a whole different conversation around ai but 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 just to say you know that that the 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 the, the, uh, the end of the world isn't nigh when it comes to zero day that's all Thank you. So we have a next question from Ben Banks. Risk ownership is interesting. Uh, do those those own the reward all, always own the risk? Maybe it's referring to the risk and reward are also owned by the same people like corporate information security officer or chief security officer and execs getting the bonus if there is no security breach. What is your view, Andy, on that one? Yes, I mean that's a that's a great question, and this is one of the pieces I'm really interested in, to be honest. Because unless you are an IT provider, uh, in my opinion, the business owns the risk. Now they may very well have a CISO or a similar kind of role which advises them at a board level, but um, in the very nature of it, the risk belongs to that board. I think all too often um, when these things go wrong, and I've, I've literally heard it quite recently from some chief execs. Um, when things have gone wrong, um, that what they do is they think the first response is I'll shout at IT. Um, uh, and then when their business is crumbling around them, they'll shout at IT some more. It isn't IT's business continuity plan that's going wrong. Uh, the business should be able to cope without IT. There is nothing that is 100% available. Um, that the, the, at the minute we, we need to be open and honest and say no matter what you spend all we can do is reduce the risk and mitigate and have better business continuity but but when it all goes wrong it's their business and they have to accept and own that risk and i think for me recently this has been a very a very sort of it, it, you know it's a learn how often do you want to get breached and how big do you want it rather than i need fifty thousand pounds because we've got a problem um actually it's up to them what they want to spend if they set the risk threshold to a three then we in it can tell them okay so a three is going to need intrusion detection it's going to need some good endpoints need lots of logging trap it's going to need a good firewall and we're going to need regular penetration tests and maybe an ongoing monitoring system as well um and this is the cost and if you don't pay that, then you're not going to get a three, you'll get a two. And that means that you will be at risk of being hacked every two years, not every five years. So I think it's those kind of conversations that I, I'm trying to get businesses to understand. But as you can imagine, it's horrific. They don't want to hear that. Uh, so next one that is uh, coming uh, from Dr. Thayad Haneet again, uh, he's asking, 
do you think ids ips development might be a solution that means what i'm thinking is probably every enterprise should have a intrusion detection and intrusion prevention solution and the ids ips solution must be continuously evolving or something like that any any views on that yeah, I mean, I'll give my two pennies on that, but I'd, then I'd be interested in David's, because David's obviously got much more experience at the sharp end of what works, what doesn't, when things go wrong, and when they sort of rescue uh, businesses um, from 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 a bad situation, but also try and help them avoid that. Um, but my thinking is, I think you're exactly right. It depends on the risk level, again, for me. If, if we're protecting data, which is a valuable asset, and the business classifi classifies that information asset as such, then they need to define what that risk level is that they are willing to accept and intrusion detection evolving intrusion detection ai pattern recognition behavioral stuff um but but a lot of it usually comes down to least privilege you know i teach my i teach my young my young daughter uh, least privilege um uh, because i think a lot of it is user behavior i mean yeah i wonder how many people on the uh, on the webinar um are forced to give their chief execs and execs team additional privilege, where actually they are the greatest risk probably in an organization. So a lot of it is about the culture and the technology will get them so far and some brilliant technology, but they have to accept that human behavior can completely undermine that if they're stupid. Dave, mm -hmm. anything, David? Uh, yeah, no, just to, just to agree with, with uh, um, with what you said as well and i think the difficulty that we have uh, and i've you know sp spent a lot of time working with uh, with with ips uh, and uh, and intrusion detection systems as well the 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 latter in my view being um more useful than the former due to the false positive problem that still hasn't been resolved within uh, network intrusion detection systems which results within ips an intrusion prevention system an inline system of preventing information getting through uh, in a situation where it thinks it's bad, and if it gets it wrong, <laughs> then you could potentially lose revenue and lose uh, lose business. So, so I'm a I'm a bigger believer in uh, in intrusion detection systems than um, um, than in intrusion prevention systems. But but the problem that we have that's starting at the moment, and Andy touched on this, is uh, is AI, uh, and uh, in, uh, particularly uh, also uh, with, along with that uh, encryption. So as I mentioned previously, you know payloads being encrypted um and uh and vulnerabilities that, that 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 don't actually be exploited until a particular set uh, of criteria are hit like the, the 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 correct ip address has been hit the appropriate person is logged in or whatever it might be to, to specialize that type of attack and the bad guys are doing that with ai now as well so network intrusion detection systems and prevention systems to that extent are are rendered unfortunately largely ineffective by by encryption and, and and that's that's the weak area now you know five or ten years ago not so much a problem now becoming more so but there's you know there's still things that can be done there's still patterns that can be recognized encrypted data impairing because you can identify encrypted data because it looks too random um can be can be signaled upon um by a, a system uh when it finds say an encrypt an, an encrypted encrypted data in a place where no encryption should be could be an indicator so th there is still methods and heuristics and ideas of, of how that can be prevented but ultimately to go back to andy's point it does boil down to the people because network intrusion detection systems are not easy to configure to get the rules right to create the rules right to write the correct heuristics to tune those things right it takes a professional and to interpret the results still takes an expert as well this isn't a set and forget tool so it still boils down to the people. And as soon as it boils down to the people, we're right back into all the stuff that Andy's been talking about, about human error and, and, and the mistakes that can be made in process. Okay, thank you. So we have one final comment uh, that's come from Andrew Kodani. Uh, there are lots of other caveman equivalent of eating the injured caveman and popular these days for example cloud storage similar scenarios where data is spread across spread across raids and servers and uh, data being in the cloud is a obvious next weak point perhaps we need a funnel part so what i'm interpreting from that is regardless of as how we move towards whatever technology that is there whether cloud or ai there are always weak points that will be there so how how we should kind of think from a cybersecurity point of view in in this area, and how should enterprise I think, address? 
Yeah, I think I think that's a, that's a, that's a very valid comment. I think that that, that, that person's exactly right. I think that while ever we continue to develop technology, we, we will continue to come across additional risks. W one of the things that I I, I sort of said uh, very openly is a lot of the problem with moving to cloud is people like me, you know, the, the Windows 8T generation who are used to going and getting the box that's under the stairs that's actually a computer room that we think and you know those people who are used to working with on-prem and thinking that's safer actually if you get cloud um if you get if you can configure cloud correctly um uh, with the with, with the professional people they have monitoring and managing it as contracts is a big important thing around patching and maintenance and management and access but actually if you get that right um David's team recently did some work with us on, as a COVID response to, to put in a, a virtual desktop, public cloud virtual desktop solution, which a, a, a friend of mine um, architected, and it was brilliant. Uh, and even with rapid implementation, because you're only concerned about a certain element of it, uh, in the, uh, you know, Microsoft in this case, but you know, obviously there's plenty of other cloud providers, um, because you recognize that the environmental management the patching can be contracted out, all those kind of things. Actually, you're only dealing with a certain component to make sure that's safe, secure, and robust. So it's a mixed bag. You know, sometimes you can benefit from those things, but if you get it wrong, the catastrophe. You know, for, for me, um, if I get something wrong on a on a on a Windows 2016, 2018 box um, locally, then that's bad. But if I get it wrong in the cloud containerization, um, it's much, much worse. So I think training and reskilling people to better understand how risks present and how they should be mitigated and recognizing the importance of, of partners in, in those skill sets and using the right company to help you ensure that you are doing it right. All those things are mitigation. Um, unless technology stands still, it's always going to be a moving feast. We're all gonna have, always going to have benefit and disbenefit. David, I don't know if there's anything else you'd sort of add in cloud. Uh, not really, Andy. No, just just to say that uh, that, that I agree. It just obviously, I mean, I can say from a penetration testing point of view that um, the amount of internal infrastructure penetration tests that we do now has uh, has decreased significantly. Um, it's something that we predicted, uh, and it's something that, uh, fortunately for us, we're, we're, we're well adapted and skilled to uh, to move uh, uh, into uh, into cloud penetration testing. And, and and the reason for that is very simple, and it's because people are gravitating towards putting their infrastructure in the cloud. So now, a lot of the penetration testing that we do is at data centers on behalf of the cloud service providers. Or, uh, or or testing the infrastructure of AWS or Azure or uh, you know Google or wherever it might be, um, uh, and, and all the reasons for doing that are the right reasons, uh, in my humble opinion. Um, it is more secure and it is safer. Uh, you, you know this this on mass move to to Office 365 as frustrating as it is for me because I don't like the idea of MS, Microsoft having a monopoly. It, it, it is flipping good, unfortunately. Um, and uh, I'm pretty robust and has some uh, some great tools as well in terms of uh, uh, monitoring um, uh, uh, malicious actions. Um, so yeah, it's 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 shifting that way, and and probably rightly so uh, in uh, in my view. Uh, great. So, so I think Andy, we have I'm just I'm just wondering whether you want to look at the results of the polls. Because we didn't show so the results I think we as were, we went through. Yeah, I think we were going to look at the results of the polls uh, it, it, at the session at the end, I think, were we? Okay. Or we can do it now, I don't mind. Um, it's whatever, I don't know if David wants to talk about it, because I think that might add a little bit to the, uh, David's presentation might add a little bit of sort of evidence either for or against what I've said in terms of the the, the journey that he, he's been through and, and, and some of the stories he's got. And then maybe if we look at those at the end, that might be a way of doing it. I'm, I'm happy to be flexible. So, you know. okay, they'll all be, they'll all be gone by then, Andy. So as soon as you're finished, mate, they're all off. <laughs> mate, I'm off now. I, yeah, I'm, as soon as you're started, yeah. I'm off to the fridge to get a beer. So, so we are done with all the questions that are there. Uh, so thank you very much, Andy. Very useful and thought provoking. So over to you, Gabby and Chris, to introduce uh, David. And thank you very much, uh, Andy, again. Okay, so we'll look at the results at the end. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. David Day. He is the um, 
the Managing Director at Samurai Digital Technologies um, Limited, D Digital Security Limited. Um, here's a little quote about him from James Bukholis, Head of Business Development at PCI Forensic Investigations. David brings a great range of skills and I have found him to be an adept operator technically and commercially. Seems like a great introduction. So David, off you go. Well, I'll I don't know, can you, see, can you see my screen? I'm just about to make you the presenter. So I'm not, I'm not sure if you can see my screen yet. I've got three screens I, as well. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a, I've got your desktop up. I'm just looking at what apps you've got in case there's any that's a bit out of date and might have a vulnerability. Oh, thank you, mate. Like yeah. So that's 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 not the screen. <laughs> that, that, that is not the screen I want you to see. Uh, so uh, that's fine though. I can move that across there. One minute. There we go. I had to. What happened to David? I'm sorry, something has happened to my computer has just locked up. Huh. Maybe while we get David back, we could ask one more um, question. Uh, let me check. Uh, so this is probably one of the questions which came late. Uh, so following the logic of, of uh, the expect to breach mantra, how do how often have you collectively thought about the user journey for a breach customer? So given that enterprise should take that they will be breached at any point of time and we should always have this consideration in mind. I think it's a question about how do you see organizations kind of uh, thinking about the user journey when, when the breach happens? So maybe if there's a just a very brief response from you, Andy. Any brief thought? Here's David's presentation. Okay. Oh, Sorry, yeah, I, I, lost, I lost that question, but we'll, we'll come back to that one, shall we? Yeah. David, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, am I visible Sorry, yet? I, I'm, Sorry, David, I don't know what happened. I got dismissed from the yeah. I got dismissed from Did the you? webinar. I was told the organizer <laughs> has dismissed you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm sorry. Down. That's yeah. all right. It's not, the, it's not the first time I've been thrown out of a, of a conference. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, okay. So can, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so uh Okay, so I'm, I presumably what you can see is the one with the slides on the left hand side as well. I'm just going to have to work with it like that. I hope that's okay. Like this, yeah, you can see the screen okay? Yep. So if I do that, I am changing a slide, am I? Yes. Right, okay. All right, off we go then. Um, okay, so uh, as very politely introduced. I'm David Day. I'm the Managing Director of Samurai Digital Security. Uh, we're a cybersecurity company and uh, we, well, we basically do everything cybersecurity related from risk assessment through to system penetration testing, secure code reviews and, uh, and information governance as well. Um, I work with the uh, National Cybersecurity Unit, the, uh, the National Crime, of, of the, uh, as part of the National Crime Agency. I'm a special officer with those guys. So they asked me to join them because I got involved with a uh, operation, uh, West Valenian, uh, which was the 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 mission to try to um, apprehend Lulsec. I don't know if you guys remember those or not, um, but I had a lot of fun with that and ended up being uh, ha having some success uh, and uh, helped to collect evidence that led to the conviction of uh, one of the members of Lulsec. Uh, who I subsequently went on to become friends with and uh, and then met all the other members of LULSEC uh, after they'd served their time and been 
uh, told off for being naughty boys uh, and ended up working with some of them as well. So I've got quite a few interesting stories to tell about that, to be fair, but I won't go into them all now. Um, it got me a bit of media attention, so I appeared on TV a bit sort of after that, um, uh, you know, at Panorama and Newsnight and BBC News and so forth. And that's a picture of me there on the screen waffling on about something or other on, on Panorama. Um, so what's this talk going to be about? So I, I, probably, again, a bit like with Andy, uh, not so much uh, about uh, directly about the technical part of cybersecurity, although I'm ab I will be absolutely delighted to answer any technical questions if you have any after the presentation. But I'm not going to get too geeky on you in this one. Um, so it, it's going to be about why we are failing to learn from our mistakes. Um, you know, why why is all this money all this effort that we're putting into cybersecurity not really getting us anywhere. And it dovetails, at least I hope it does, quite nicely with uh, with what Andy was saying about the problem being down to people, and it is mostly down to people. Uh, I mean, even when you consider technical tools, the selection of those tools as well, how, how effective they are, what tools to select, when to use them, is still down to individuals and unfortunately we are good at getting things wrong um like me getting you know kicked out of a presentation or the inability for me to share a screen with you <laughs> mistakes happen right because we're human so here's some recent headlines uh some of them are recent actually some of them probably aren't quite so recent now because i was too lazy to change the slide too much um okay <laughs> i just had an apology for kicking me out it's fine don't worry about it um, right, so Twitter, uh, so we had the Twitter hack recently, we did a podcast about that, if you want to listen to more about that, you can uh, have a listen to that. Um, but a whole barrel of things there look, that have uh, that have gone wrong uh, relatively uh, recently. Um, obligatory scary facts. Now I want you to have a think about this, right, because what I don't want to happen is for, you, for, for this to, to, for you to just think, oh, you know what, this is yet another slide with scary facts on it and every cybersecurity presentation I've ever been to has these statistics and some guy saying wow look at that aren't they bad so I'm not going to do that right but what I am going to do is say there they are there's some facts I want you actually to have a think about those in context of the next slide which unfortunately you can still see on the screen down to the fact that I haven't I can't can't get this to present without it appearing on the wrong screen um, I probably could if I played around with this setting a bit here but I don't want to do that right now uh, right okay so obligatory scary facts lots of them there I'll move on. So this is the bad news, the bad news about bad news. So I got a hunch, right, that you guys will look at these scary facts and probably not pay them an awful lot of attention. You'll look at them, maybe you'll read them, and then you'll think, it's got nothing to do with me, right? Or you might think, that's an overestimate. Or uh, really, yeah, I don't think so. Uh, so maybe you dismiss it, maybe you, it just bores you, Maybe you turn off from it, um, but I think statistically, probably quite likely that you don't read them and think, oh my goodness, I better do something about it. So they they don't work, right? So the bad news for those, all those guys who've been out selling cybersecurity for years, they don't work because we don't like bad news, right? We ignore it. We see bad news and we pay it no attention. Now, this isn't me speaking, right? It's, uh, you know, it's, actually, to be fair, it's not Freud either. <laughs> but, but there's been plenty of studies and plenty of uh, research that has been performed um, that identifies the fact that when we're presented with bad news, we don't tend to pay it attention. I'll give you an example, a personal example. Um, I have a terrible habit of not opening my post. It comes through the door, it mounts up. I don't open it. Why don't I open it? Because I know it's going to be bank statements and bills. And I don't like looking at bank statements and bills because my bank statements tend to go down. And I don't like looking at them. It upsets me. So what I do instead is I ignore them. And then at some point when I'm feeling particularly positive and very brave, I'll go through and open them all. Um, and that's because we ignore bad news. There's been other research that suggests that people who play the stock market, right, when, when their portfolios are doing well, they're checking their shares, they're checking their stocks frequently as they're going up. Oh, it's gone up again. Oh, it's gone up again. Oh, it's gone up again. But then when it starts to go down, Mm, they're not so keen on looking at it. I mean, I do the same with Bitcoin, right? If Bitcoin's going up, I'm like, great, Bitcoin's going up. I'll, and I check it every day. And then when I see that it's dropping, I'm like, ah, I'm not going to play anymore. 
because uh, that's how that's how we do it. We don't like bad news; it upsets us. You don't, you so we don't do it. So we 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 uh, we block it out or we minimise it, uh, as I've got in the point there. Uh, and there's the death effect, the death effect as well. So if somebody gives you bad news if it doesn't fit in with something that makes you feel happy, you tend to ignore it. And the problem that we have in the cybersecurity industry is because we'll try to explain to people the absolute truth and the facts of the matter and they get ignored. They'll either be thought, do you know what, you would say that, you work for a cybersecurity company, you're trying to sell me something. Whatever whatever reason that you want to give yourself, you give yourself for not believing what's you know, blatantly obvious. Uh, I, I, that's a generalization, of course, I'm not saying that everybody does that, but as a, as a general rule, that does go on, unfortunately. Um, so uh, things that are true, things you know, things that you believe, right? They are, generally speaking, distinct. So there's things that you believe and where that intersects with the things that are true are the things that you know. So they're things that you believe that are the truth. You know them, right? And that's fine because you've got it right. But if you look at those Venn diagrams, and oh, I, I can't say these are exactly to scale, but I would argue that, 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 that there will be some truth to the scale of them that uh, you know, we, we have, there's an awful lot of things we have to accept that are true and that we don't believe. And we also have to ex uh, accept as well, there's an awful lot of things that we believe that are true. And only a small section of the things that we know, you know, uh, is the case. So, you know, that, 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 that's a difficult one to accept, but I think we should. I, I think, you know, you, you, should ha you should be qu querying your beliefs and, the, the 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 reason for this is that if you don't it's going to lead to poor decisions um but i mean you know if you don't believe me right if you don't believe me if you think i might be making a mistake when i'm saying this donald trump's in power and you know i i, I, I don't really know what how, how clearer to make it that that is that things that you believe aren't always true trump fans doubt it i think i'm probably on safe ground with that one <laughs> Right, uh, dominance hierarchy, another reason why we make bad decisions, right? I mean, a lot of this is down to, 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 to ego, but in, in 1978, and this will resonate, I should imagine, with, uh, with Andy, because he likes a bit of flying, I'm, I'm led to believe. But in 1978, uh, a DC-10 was making a scheduled stop in Denver. During this scheduled stop, as the landing gear was coming down, it made an abnormal noise made this funny grating noise. And the sign, which indicates that the landing gear is down, failed to come on. Now you would think, wouldn't you, that that would, that would be the, the reason for the, the plane crashing, but it wasn't. The reason the plane crashed was because it ran out of fuel. And the reason it ran out of fuel is for the following reasons. The captain himself was focused intently on trying to solve this problem with the landing gear right so so he wasn't sure was it down was it not down he really didn't know he he was making dozens of checks um to different things that you can do to try to detect whether the landing gears down checking the flaps and other things and trying to find out if it was down or not um, then he started challenging the bulb was there a problem with the bulb on the indicator was there something electrical problem that was causing that at the same time, he was uh, he was sending the uh, the flight attendants out to try and prepare the crew for an emergency landing in case the gear wasn't down. Uh, all of this time, he's circling the airport, right? And his fuel is going down and down and down and down. And as the fuel goes down, the first officer and the flight engineer notice this, right? They clock on that the uh, the fuel is going down, but they don't make it clear. They allude to it once or twice but they don't make it clear. They don't say, mate, we're going to run out of fuel unless you go to that airport now and land this thing. Um, and the reason why they didn't is because of the, 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 the subordinate position they were in and the fear of challenging the captain. You know, the, the, I, I, culturally, this is even worse. There's incidents where this happened in, in, with, with, with Chinese aircraft as well, uh, particularly with the, with the co-pilot, disagrees with the pilot, doesn't say anything because he's scared of, of, of uh, undermining the, uh, the captain uh, and ultimately what happened 
they ran out of fuel. They ran out of fuel and the plane came down and it crashed into a bunch of civilian houses, killed 10 people in the plane. Fortunately, it didn't kill anybody on the ground, uh, uh, wrote off the plane and obviously people lost their lives. And it was a, a, a terrible and completely avoidable catastrophe. Um, and for those of you that are wondering, yeah, the landing gear was down. So this goes on. We don't, you know, and this is something. So why did I bring that up? Okay, let me let me let me let me make the point on that one, and I'll I'll make it anecdotal, right? So some what I meet sometimes with 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 organisations and I have conversations with them, and frequently I speak to uh, to to engineers, to uh, tech savvy people, uh, systems architects. Um, uh, 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 coders, programmers, analysts, designers, um, and these guys, are, you know, if, if I level with you, they're my kind of people, really. We, you know, we get on well, we geek out a bit, and uh, and we recognise the need for DevSecOps, for system penetration testing, secure code reviews, and all the rest of it. Um, and then, oftentimes, either what we propose to try to help is either rejected or only partially implemented. And this is, even though all of the technical people completely agree and recognize the need for it, and it's usually undermined by somebody in power, right? Who's, who's, who's the boss, who doesn't necessarily understand the technical implications or the risks and makes a decision. And the, deci and, and, and the people underneath are too afraid to counteract him, or they just think he's got to be right. He's the boss, um, and this is a problem. I think it, you know it leads to to poor decisions. Um, you know that 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 issue, uh, and, and that's what I was sort of you know alluding to with the dominance hierarchy, United Airlines Flight One Seven Three example. So you know the, the the other problem is when the mistakes do happen, we don't learn from them, right? We don't we don't you know oftentimes we don't like to admit our failures and this is th this happens a lot in the medical industry you know where where because it's you know it's almost unacceptable of course it happens you know doctors make mistakes patients die doesn't mean they're a bad doctor um but those those doctors will rarely rarely admit to making a mistake because it's so it's you know it's so unacceptable to do so so within that particular industry you know and i and, and I, can, I can give you some personal um uh, experience of this. So, so my daughter has a condition. She has cystic fibrosis, unfortunately. And uh, I was at the doctor's. Uh, she she was with her her team uh, at, at at a hospital, and um, <laughs> and uh, uh, sorry, that was an inappropriate laugh. Somebody just that I had a message through from one of the organisers. Um, and uh, when when they were talking to me they said look this is treatment that's coming out that can help your daughter and i said well what is it and they said it's uh, it's it's a uh, 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 trichafter i said trichafter won't work on her I said yes it will so no words so genetic mutations aren't the right ones for it oh i think it will I said well okay i'll let you look at look look into that right and i knew it wouldn't uh and then when i got home i sent an email to the same doctor and i said you know um can you just confirm that i'm correct and it doesn't work and he didn't reply and said he was wrong he said, I've looked into it. Unfortunately, it won't work on your daughter. No reference at all to the full conversation we'd had where he basically said that it would. So there's, there's, this, there's this pride, this ego that prevents you from accepting the fact that you've made a mistake. And if you don't accept the fact you've made a mistake, you're going to make it again. Right. Another example of this, the, the, the criminal justice system. Um, and uh, and a situation where a 19 year old was accused of raping and murdering uh, an 11 year old uh, an 11 year old girl he was found guilty uh, he was given uh, uh, life in prison and then after 13 years the dna proved him innocent proved him innocent beyond any doubt at all you know borderline to you know uh, a delta sigma zero uh, a chance of it being wrong uh, but the prosecutors would not admit to the mistake they wouldn't admit it. It was another six years before he got released because the pro because the, they just thought something must be wrong. There's something weird going with the DNA. 
somehow that 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 sample of blood DNA came from came came it was him that still did it but somehow some other blood got there as well all kinds of ridiculous nonsensical reasons that they didn't make a mistake and let me tell you this happens in cybersecurity as well I have clients who who I've I've, I've talked to and I've done some work with and I've spotted problems and I've said to them there's an issue here you know, you, you, you're going to have to get this resolved. You're going to have to get this fixed. Honestly, there'll be a consequence if you don't. Uh, and they said, mm, and I've said, look, if you don't do it, it's fine. But you will get back to me at some point and say, David, you were right. We should have sorted it out. And in that, <laughs> and then they do, right? They get back to me and they said, do you know what? You were dead right about that. And I have to be honest with you. I'm coming back now and, uh, and, uh, and I'm going to admit the fact that there was a problem. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'd like to get it sorted out. And I say, okay, let's get it sorted out. They say, yeah, but just that one thing. Just that one thing that we were breached on, we want sorting out. So, well, hang on, what about the other four things? No, just that one that we're breached on. But, you know, the other things are still there. It's going to happen again. Uh, I think we've had our breach now. Whatever the reason is, I don't know. But then it happens again. And again, the fact that they made a mistake by not having it sorted in the first place doesn't get accepted. And I've, I've actually had it happen three times where somebody's been hacked. They've been hacked again and they've been hacked again again. <laughs> because each time I've told them to put these things in place, they haven't put them in place. Um, I've had companies where I've said, we'll do a free vulnerability assessment for you. We'll test your systems externally for free, right? It won't even cost you anything. And they said, no, I don't want you to do that. Okay, why not? Because we know you'll find something's wrong. Well, yes. And if you find something's wrong, we, uh, we're going to have to get it fixed. And, uh, you know, I, I, we don't really have the time for fixing it right now just unbelievable it's like well how do you know that what we find wrong you can't fix yourself in about five minutes but anyway i don't know not learning from mistakes is a problem and there's 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 a lot of these right there's a lot of these issues with um what 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 are termed cognitive biases our our inability to to reason correctly and make the right decisions and i've just given an example of some of the more common ones here so outcome bias the decision evaluated based on outcome just because it worked once doesn't mean it was correct choice so you could say you know what you could you have a breach you put a firewall in you don't get breached for the next two years for that same issue you might get breached for other things that you don't know about by the way but that's another conversation and you think oh okay it's the firewall that's right we put the firewall in place that's definitely uh, that sorted it out well no not necessarily the the it could just be coincidence right so i you know i i, I remember the first time i went to a casino Right, and I went to a casino and I I won some money. I bet uh, uh, odds evens, black white. Did that thing with on the roulette where you where you pick a number and then spread your your tokens around it. And I won a load of cash and I walked out the door with loads of money. Thought brilliant, uh, uh, that was lucky, wasn't it? But, so I went back again, maybe a week or two later. Did the same, won again, more money. Right, oh, doing all right. Went back a third time, won a few quid. Then so I've won three times on the trot now. Right, so I'm thinking. I've got a system. Right? I've got a system. I've cracked it. I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna I'm gonna take I'm gonna clean these guys out. Went in again, and on that on that fourth time of going in, I I realized I worked out why they have cash point machines inside of casinos. I got absolutely fleeced. Um, and you know, and and that was my own bias. That was outcome bias. It worked once. I figured it was gonna work again. Right? It's ridiculous, but the problems and we make them in. Uh, in cybersecurity all the time, we put a system in place and we think that, uh, you know, because that system, because we haven't had bad results, it means that system works. It doesn't mean that system works necessarily. Uh, confirmation bias, another one, favor information that confirms your own belief. We all do this, don't we? Sometimes, you know, you 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 have an argument down the pub and then you'll search the answer to, 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 to find one that suits what you already believe. Conspiracy theorists love this, don't they? You know, they'll go and search for evidence to support their own beliefs. And it's a very worrying one in terms of decision making, in terms of the problems that it can cause us. Um, uh, also, if you make a decision, you're more likely to justify it, even if it fails. So if you do buy that fancy new firewall and you still get breached, you'll still justify the fact that expenditure was worth it because you're, you, you've tied your sense of identity into that purchase. And if you, you know, to, to, to admit that you made the wrong choice, well, that's quite painful. But you also, again, going back to the learning about mistakes, you don't learn from it. Ostrich effect, we're all very familiar with that one. It'll never happen to me. It will never happen to me. You know those scary statistics? It'll never happen to you. You know, this is what we do. 
overconfidence again this is the problem with with it's a problem it's you know it's very common with managers is overconfidence and do you know what you kind of need it in management to, to have that level of confidence to inspire that level of um you know to, to to so so that those around you have some belief in you but it could also cause a problem because that overconfidence is contagious so sometimes you start arguing a point and your point is wrong and you'll convince all the people that know more about it that you are right and they are wrong I've had this before, or I don't know if you've ever had, if you ever had a technical discussion with somebody who's hardcore sales, that's fascinating. I've had that in the pub a few times and sometimes I go home and that guy, that that hard nosed salesperson knows absolutely nothing about the subject he's talking about. And I go home and check to make sure that I'm right on a technical level because he's so convincing. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, it can cause problems within teams where poor decisions are made because the person who's less technical able is the person that everybody listens to the most. Um, and that's that, that, that goes with the bandwagon effect as well. And optimism too, you know, that, that causes the same issues there. All common in managers, uh, something if you are a manager, you need to be mindful of yourself. Uh, change blindness. We don't notice problems when they're happening. I'm going to give you a very quick example here. When the uh, when the space shuttle uh, with Challenger uh, came crashing down, th th this wasn't the cause of the accident, by the way. But one of the things they did note, and we will talk about that shortly uh, if I've got time, was that the the fan blades um, they, they found that some of the the, the blades on the engines were uh, 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 cracked, uh, micro fractures in them, and they came down and uh, it, you know. Uh, uh, it was argued, it was it was said, well, you know, uh, why are these cracks here? They said, well, it doesn't matter why they're there. It's well within tolerance, so it's fine, which is a ridiculous thing when you think about it, because it doesn't matter the fact they're intolerance. What matters is the fact you don't know why they're there. And if you don't know why they're there, how do you know that next time it's still going to be intolerance if you don't know what caused them in the first place? And we see this all the time in network intrusion detection. It happens commonly. We see incidents of something happening, and we don't know why it's happening. We know a breach hasn't occurred, but something's going on. We can see these. We can see these logs happening. We don't know why they're happening. Okay, we're not being breached, but we don't know why they're there. It doesn't matter. We haven't been breached. Of course, it matters because that could be part of a bigger problem, and we miss it. And the reason why I've got Bert Reynolds up there is just to illustrate the point. Bert Reynolds was in a bar once, uh, and uh, he was, uh, as as he was prone to do, <laughs> having a drink. And uh, and next to him was a very obnoxious character that was. Um, being rather abusive to the uh the barmaid behind the bar and and to other customers as well uh so uh bert reynolds uh took him up took on bridge to him told him about himself this guy got very aggressive back at bert reynolds uh was was again you know uh very very hostile so bert reynolds being bert reynolds chinned him uh knocked him flying across the bar and it, and and it wasn't until he actually looked at the guy after he'd flown across the bar, they realized this guy didn't have any legs. Uh, and then I obviously felt rather stupid and foolish. Uh, and this is because we miss things, particularly when we're fired up emotionally, we miss them. That's a true story, by the way, you can read upon that. It's one of Burt Reynolds' classics uh, 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 that he likes to, to, to talk about or did. Um, so why do we keep making the same mistakes? Let's, let, let, let's, let's go for uh, one of the... Um, Let's go for one of the polls, and I don't know how this is going to work, by the way, because I think I think you can only do yes or no answers. But uh, you know, do do you think right? Uh, and uh, I, I don't know if it's yes or no. We'll say yes is sunny, and we'll say no is rainy. Then, uh, do you think uh, New York cab drivers work more hours on rainy days than on sunny ones? Can we do that? Is that going to work? Yep, it's going to work, and it's got sunny and rainy. Oh, hey, I'm impressed. Shall I show the results right away? Uh, uh, well, how many results have we got? So, yes, is, so sunny, yeah, oh, do they work? Do they work? All right, oh, so no, I'll we'll ask wait. question again. We'll wait till, we'll wait till, yeah. Okay, okay, but we, we will do the results before we move on, yeah. So, so do we think that New York cab drivers work more hours on rainy days or on sunny ones? And I'd be quite interested to see, when do I get to see the results? Um, In a sec. How many? We're up to sixty-seven percent voted. Okay. We well, maybe another maybe ten we'll... seconds or so. Okay. Okay. Um, and there's no right or wrong answer to this, by the way. Um, either you're going to get it right because you're smart and you've worked it out, um, or you're going to get it wrong 
because you're smart and you've worked this out. <laughs> and, 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 okay, so I'm going to close the poll. Okay. And we'll have a look. 70, okay. 71 percent of voted after a minute. So here we go. So what we got? We've got 63% said are smart and said rainy. 37% are smart and said sunny. Okay, all right. So uh, here's the interesting thing with taxi drivers uh, in New York. Uh, they're, they're not overly bright, as it turns out, um, because more they work more hours on sunny days than they do on rainy days. So if you went for sunny, uh, so strictly speaking, you were correct, but it all depends on your logic. It depends on whether you've overestimated the intelligence of New York cab drivers, because it would make far more sense for New York cab drivers to work more hours during rainy days. And the reason for this is because when it rains, people like to catch cabs. Uh, so the more hours you work on a rainy day, the more money you're gonna make because you're gonna have more people there to pick up and to get uh, uh, fares from. However, New York cab drivers don't think like that. What the New York cab drivers think is it's sunny, they have less fares. And in their mind, they think there's a certain amount of money I need to make today. I need to make X amount of money. Therefore, they will work longer to get that fixed figure. When it's raining, they can get the money maybe in two, three hours and they take the rest of the day off, uh, which is insane when you think about it. It would make far more sense, wouldn't it, for them to take the, the sunny days off when there's less work a, because it's sunny, and B, because they're losing less revenue. Unfortunately, their mind is fixed on cash. And this is a problem with cybersecurity as well, by the way. The focus is always about the money and the detail gets missed. The actual works best gets missed because the, the, the focus is on the cash. And in this instance, they get it wrong. So here's another one. Uh, and... Uh, you, uh, you know, you, you you can't vote on this one, right? So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna let you think in your own head, okay? And some of you might get the some of you might know the answer because you've seen it before. If you know the answer because you've seen it before, not impressed at all. That just means that you've read it somewhere, and that's not impressive if you get it right. A father and son have a car accident and are both badly hurt. They are both taken to separate hospitals. When the boy is taken in for an operation, the surgeon says, "I cannot do the surgery because this is my son." How is this possible? Now, uh, when I ask this question to a live audience, uh, I'm not saying that you're not live, I'm sure you're perfectly live, but you know what I mean, in person, face to face, um, then I get uh, some insane answers, right? Some absolutely crazy ones. So I get things like, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the father was a priest, you know, <laughs> or, or uh, you know, the, the boy has two dads, you know, they're, they're a gay couple with two dads. All kinds of crazy, crazy answers. But the really obvious answer is uh, is missed, right? The really obvious answer. Uh, so a father and a son have a car accident and are both badly hurt. They are both taken to separate hospitals. When the boy's taken in for operation, the surgeon says, I cannot do the surgery because this is my son. How is this possible? Because the surgeon is his mum. And Here's the interesting thing about this. You would think, so some of you got that right. Some of you have never seen that before and you got that right. Statistically, I know that 20% of you probably got, you know, would have, should have got that right. 80% um, of you, however, if you didn't get that, if you'd never seen it before and you didn't get it, you're actually in the majority and you're well in the majority. That's eight out of 10. And here's the interesting thing, right? They've, they've done this, uh, they've asked that same question to um, all women, audiences, or men audiences, a mix of the two, uh, and the results are identical. So, so, so this isn't a you know a a a, a, a sexist thing, right? That that seems to have no bearing on it. They even did this to uh, to people who identified as a, a, a feminist, and actually, in fairness fractionally more of them did actually get the right answer, but only marginally, you know, uh, borderline st statistically insignificant. Um, so the point here is that, that these generalizations that we make are incredibly powerful. Environmental and, uh, uh, and lifestyle do not affect the results of that particular questioning, but our ability to generalize, we do this, our shortcut in thinking 
our uh, 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 Daniel Canibet, I think his name is, if you ever look into that, there's the system one and system two ways of thinking. That system one, very thick, in, uh, 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 fast, instant decision-making thought process, which mental shortcuts that you take to come to a conclusion cause bad decisions. Uh, goodness knows whether this is going to work, um, but I've got, a, I've got a video. Should I try and play it, see what happens? Try and play it. Let's give it a go. If it, do, if it doesn't work, uh, meh. Who's thinking? Can you hear it? No. I can hear that. Can you hear it? Do you want to do the sound effects? Yeah, I would say. I don't know if you heard that or not, actually. I don't know if you got the audio on that. But um, yeah, not very nice viewing that one. Um, and that that actually was uh, an avoidable accident. And uh, Richard Feynman, who was the, uh, um, the, 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 the famous physicist, um, who's, uh, who's actually a bit of a bit of a hero of, of mine, to be honest with you. I absolutely think that guy's amazing. And if you want to look into some of the things that he said in his, uh, um, in his review of that accident uh, in the appendix of the formal report, I would, uh, I would recommend that you do. There's a lot to be learned from that. Um, so uh, Richard Feynman stated that he talked to all the people, many of the people, not all of them, many of the people that were involved in, uh, the instrumental people that were involved in the shuttle launch, he was given two figures, uh, one of one in one in a hundred and one in one in a hundred thousand is the chances of that shuttle blowing apart. So, you know, I, I would, you know, it, not, not, not a poll, but uh, have a think. Who do you think gave the one in a hundred thousand figure? Who do you think gave the one in a hundred figure? Well, if you've said the people that gave the one in a hundred figure were the engineers and the people that gave the one in a hundred thousand figure were the management, you would be correct. And statistically, there's been two Challenger accidents, the, and there were 255 flights, I think it was. So the engineers were perfectly correct in their estimation of the likelihood of there being an accident. But our engineers listen to rarely. I refer you back to all my previous points. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go quickly through these last slides now to wrap it up because I think I'm probably pushing it on time. Um, so. It, from a cybersecurity perspective, what should you do? You have a budget, you have, uh, normally you want maximum protection with minimum cost, minimum effort, minimum time. What are your options? You're thinking, okay, maybe legal compliance, GDPR, DPA 2018, PCR, e-privacy directive. I've got to get them sorted because I don't get them sorted, I'm going to get fined by the ICO or whatever it might be. Maybe you're thinking stakeholder confidence. I want to make sure that the stakeholders um, uh, are confident in me as a, as a, as, a, as an organization that I can um, do my job right. So maybe I should get Cyber Essential, Cyber Essentials Plus, IASME, ISO 27001 you know, to, to let them know, or maybe I should do contingency planning incident response. There's so much to go at, isn't there, in terms of, you know, what to do to make your system secure. And then you think, well, hang on a minute, I'm already, I've already done all of this because I had, did that GDPR stuff a couple of years back, no problem, it's all sorted out. Quick Venn diagram there, uh, is that to scale? <laughs> Probably not, but it feels like it to me. Um, you know, th th that little, that GDPR compliance that you did, GDPR compliance isn't cybersecurity, right? There's a small, small bit of GDPR that falls within the cybersecurity remit. Compliance is not security. GDPR, PCI, DSS, PCR, great things to have. They are not security. Standards, certifications, they're subjective. They're down to an individual to choose whether they feel that what you're doing meets an, a, a particular standard. Many different individuals all looking at it. I'll be honest with you, not all of them experts. Um, ticking, giving you a rubber stamp, signing something off, doesn't mean that you're secure. Don't think it. Don't think it. Don't think I've got ISO 27001. I'm all sorted. Um, it's it's worrying that people might do that. 
only a few slides left. Right, so uh, what should you spend your money on? Well, do you know what? You don't know until you have a risk assessment, until you go through and look at every organisation is diff different and what some organisations should be spending money on, some others shouldn't and vice versa, you know. So what are your business critical systems and assets? What are they worth to you? What could happen to them? What would be the consequences if you lost them? How likely is it to happen? And then we have this metric of risk equals likelihood, the chance of it happening, multiplied by consequence, the impact of it happening. And then, you know, we go through, we look at, you know, as as a company, what we do if we visit an organization is we we have lots of discussions, have lots of conversations and find out where the risk is, where the risk lies. And these involve a lot of what if conversations sometimes. What would happen if? What would happen if you came in and uh, half a dozen of your workstations had ransomware on them? What would you do? What would happen if you came in and your internet was down and one of the servers that connects to the internet was instrumental for your business? What would you do? Um, you know, th these these what if scenarios. Uh, and so, so what's useful is you talk through a business's process, how it makes money, right? Where its cash is, how it, how it survives. And then you look for the bits that are going to hit that the hardest. And then you talk about the ways that they can be broken. And to be fair, Andy's talk, right? covered a lot of this because it's the very very often it's the people so much of this comes through phishing but you don't you know you don't know what you need to do where you need to put your effort until you find out where your risk is and this is why i think you know when when you do unless you're an expert in cyber security yourself you do need somebody else to come in and to do this because all of the cognitive biases which i mentioned before you're not seeing, you know, if you see something wrong all the time, you recognize it more easily, right? You, you wouldn't, you wouldn't um, uh, totally trust the internet, would you, in diagnosing yourself with a, with a medical ailment? You'd go and see somebody. Um, and, and, and this is true as well when it comes to, to, to risk assessments. You can do quite a bit on your own, but you can't do everything on your own because you don't know what all the potential attack vectors are. As a security company, we see them every day different attack vectors we see the new ones coming in we see the old ones that are sticking about and understanding what the risk is puts you in a stronger position to decide where to put your money because uh, if you don't understand fully where the risk is you're going to put your money in all kinds of crazy places and it's going to be a waste of money is cybersecurity a waste of money yes if you don't do a proper risk assessment uh that's a salesy slide i've been told not to hang about on that one so i won't um and uh, and that's that are there any questions there are a few questions. Here's one from Ken Jakeby. Do you think the reason why clients don't carry out recommendations is due to keeping within budget as trying to justify more money is so difficult if there's no breach? So possibly mm. they believe a small breach is good for their budget. They're probably right, <laughs> if, if I'm honest. Um, yeah, I mean, the majority, uh, you know, if, 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 if I just go totally transparent with you, the majority of the people that come to us have been breached before at some point, which is a terrible, terrible shame um, because the, the, the measures are far, far more um, useful proactively uh, than they are reactively. Um, I, 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 I feel for the people when they try to convince their bosses that they need to spend money. And I understand how difficult that is to do. But do you know what? I can tell you this. It, it, it's a lot more. It, it takes a combined effort, to be fair, because there's, 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 there's things that you can argue internally in terms of needing more budget that you get listened to because you're, you're not, you know, you're not perceived as being tried to sell anything. You can say, listen, I would, I'm, the only reason I'm saying this is because I've got the best interest of the company at heart. Somebody outside of the organization quite often is just perceived as, you know, you would say that you're trying to sell us something. So it's a very difficult one to, to win. Having said that, sometimes an external as well saying, listen, there really is a problem here. Backing up the internal can, can, can uh, and make an impression to get that extra budget. And, and it's 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 a it's a painful truth actually what 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 uh, what is just, what that 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 that, uh, that comment that sometimes a little painless breach that that doesn't hurt too badly can be beneficial because it raises their their awareness and their attention and I don't have a solution to that unfortunately um, uh, and if you can think of one uh, please do let me know because I'd love to know what the secret is to to get the message through to those in, in charge, they, uh, they really need to get the budgets right when it comes to cybersecurity. You can quote 
the the thousand and one different instances of breaches at them uh, until you're blue in the face. Same companies with issues. Um, you know, you can point the problems out to them, and often it won't get through because of all the things I've talked about in this presentation. Um, all, all I can say is that you know now you know what you're up against. Maybe maybe you can try to find a way of of getting around that. If you can if you can make the budget holder feel like it's their idea, that, that's even better rather than it coming from you. Yeah, good answer. Okay, so Alex Hayes has said even high profile attacks didn't permanently harm the viability of the NHS, Equifax, TravelX, or Mesk. The consequences are currently not grave enough to force organisations to care. Can this only be solved with legislation that actually has teeth? Maybe compared to the approaches taken to health and safety practices and law in the last few decades. Okay, well, some, somebody, and I, I think Andy might, would, would want to say something on this as well, but I'll tell you this. I, I know somebody, and Andy knows the same person, and neither of us are going to say who it is, right, Andy? But somebody I know um, uh, used to work uh, pretty high up uh, in the NHS. And um, during the, the WannaCry incident, which, uh, which I actually knew about through the NCA who got in touch with me and told me about the issue as it was breaking out, um, a problem to do with SMB, which I did actually give a heads up about some years earlier, but I won't go into that. Uh, the, 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 so the NCA got in touch with me and basically said, well, this, we've got this problem with the NHS, can you try and help us out? And I jumped on that and tried to help them out with a, with a, a, a team of other specials. At the same time, this particular individual who remained nameless came around to my house saying, we're really in trouble here. This particular piece of malware is causing terrible problems. Can you help us out? So I actually had an exec and the NCA both at me at the same time trying to help sort this, uh, this, this, this particular issue out. And the exec themselves said, this is going to kill people. And it did, you know, you know in my view, right? And maybe somebody could argue differently, but I'd, I would be happy to have that debate with them. That, that WannaCry attack caused people to die. There was operations that were cancelled, critical operations that were either cancelled and pushed back that cost lives. So, so let's not kid ourselves about uh, you know high profile breaches not causing serious incidents because that one certainly did. So I wanted to get that point across first as well. I don't want to minimise that that impact. Um, and there, but, but there is some legislation, right? So we have the uh, the NIS um, uh, regulation directive, I think it is. It came out at the same time as the uh, as gdpr it kind of went under the radar because gdpr was making so much noise but that's in place to try to stop this very thing from happening to try to tighten up on the security is it being adopted correctly i don't think so we've done a podcast on it please feel free to listen to that um are the right people in charge of it to make it work well some of them are we, fortunately we have uh, uh, the the uh, uh, ncse involved in that and i'm a big fan of those and i think they're doing great work but I, I, I question whether some of the people that are actually behind the implementation to make NIS a, a reality are the right people to be doing it. And, and that, that's a part of a bigger discussion, which I, I, I'd be happy to have it a, a, on another occasion, but perhaps not right now. Uh, I don't know, Andy, have you got anything to say about that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult to say that, that it, it directly attributed sort of that, that, that extremity but the, the the reality was it was it was a complete devastation um, in some areas um, and it's testament to the clinicians that they just decided that they could get on with it and suddenly they realized they can work without computers but it was it was more the dis it was more the 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 recovery time than anything and, and, and actually you know the anatomy of that um, incident in the NHS and public sector has been well sort of um, well reviewed and if you read those reports um, it, it, it was pretty much what we've been saying tonight it, it wasn't because these people in in IT are inept um, it was because systems that they were having to support still required uh, protocols that were vulnerable so you know instead of in spend, instead of spending money on sorting that out um, uh, 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 and implementing systems that were more robust and uh, and, and secure, um, additional cybersecurity controls were implemented, which ultimately failed through the human being. You know, it, it was it was as simple as that. And, and actually, the NHS was collateral damage. As we, you know, it was it wasn't the target. Um, but the the problem was that that so many NHS organisations used systems that required SMB. Uh, SMB. One or two or whatever, two whatever. It was called. Um, and that was the problem. So good people who'd been not 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 like David said, who who'd not been listened to, 
having to deliver systems that the business didn't want to change and update because it's a hassle, because it's expensive, because it actually means disruption to patient care in itself. Um, so, you know, th this is the this is the problem. And until that point, even during that point, I mean, I saw, fortunately, I was away uh, when all that kicked off in, a, in an area that didn't have a phone signal. That was brilliant. But um, oh, well, other, than that, other than that, good piece of luck. Um, you know, the, the, the reality is that the first part of that episode was people shouting at IT. You must get this sorted. You just do this. People are going to die. And we had this with COVID. I recently had this similar situation with COVID where where, where doctors and, and, and managers were saying, we need this, we need that, we need the other. And there was a, dis, there was a disagreement. And I was saying, I, I, my professional opinion got that wrong. Um, and they were saying, well, people will die if we don't do this. And I said, well, if you get this wrong, tens of thousands of people will die. Which one do you want to pick? Uh, uh, and let's both write down what our decision is. Um, and do you know what? For once in my life, turns out I was right. So, uh, you know, th these are the these are the stories that need to underpin why the business owns the risk, not IT. So they either listen to us in our professional opinion, but if they don't, that's fine because it's on their business failing that the consequences will fall. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I guess just, that means people die. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's the reality <laughs> these days. And, and the difficulty, again, is is learning from those mistakes as well. You know, overcoming those obstacles to learn from the mistakes. And, you know, while, but while, like you while said, the David, fear doesn't work. So very quickly, we forget that negative stuff. Association information bias means that in order to function, we very quickly forget what filled us with fear and paralyzed us. Um, and then you have the whole, as you described, gambler's fallacy. Well, it's happened to me once. It Lightning doesn't strike twice. Of course it does. Mm, this kind so, of lightning. You know, those, yeah, those kind of behaviors become embedded within an organizational culture if we're not careful. And, and I still have the same thing today. So, I, I, you know, just as a quick, very quick aside, I, I wanted to do a cyber event and the board were, you know, they are, we've done these desktop exercises, whatever. And then I said, well, this one might be. So well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to blow the hospital up. I said, what? <laughs> I said, I'm going to blow the hospital up because actually my background was a bit more in cyber terrorism. Um, I've got an exploit where I could do that. And, you know, that 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 changes the dynamic because they don't see risk in the same ways we do. We don't see the Internet of Things. They don't see just how everything is an attack surface these days, even the human being. And as Davis described, some of those biases are the most important weaknesses that we need to be addressing and mitigating. Yeah, so 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 basically, what 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 I think I reckon both of us really have been saying, Andy, is that we need to expand the problem domain out here, the problem space out. We need to expand it out from being one that's just 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 technical, and we need to expand it out into one that encompasses, you know, people and and, Policy, and how they think and how people, they reason, you know. Yeah, partners and supply chain is a massive issue. It's a, it's a bigger, it's a bigger, much bigger problem than just technology. A much bigger problem. I guess Agreed. that's where enterprise architecture comes in, doesn't it? People process. exactly, and I think that's what I'd. That's exactly what I'd love to see, sort of more of a focus on as we move forward in this world. You know, empowering the enterprise architects, because you know, a, a, a lot of time we just buy a system. Back to that, actually, if an organisation has an enterprise architecture, they should design the bits that fit together, and you should buy the system that fits into that. But as part of that design the human aspects, the policy aspects, the regulatory aspects, the partner and supply chain aspects, all need to be conforming. And the business needs to listen to that blueprint rather than individual. And if you find a way to do that, please give me a call because it'd be really handy. Yeah, and me too, please. I'd like to take that same call. <laughs> <laughs> Networking That's, our challenge. That's our Networking, challenge, isn't it? Networking Information Systems Regulations 2018, just to go back to the original commenter's comment, um, that that that's that's what they've tried to put in place to legally offer the protection which you're discussing. I don't think that I don't think a particularly good job has been done of it. And I think it, it needs a lot more work, but they are trying at least. One of the best things I heard recently was a chief exec who uh, who was in charge of a local authority that had been breached. 
a ransomware type thing. Uh, and, and she describes the journey in the same ways that we've talked about. The initial response is shouting at IT, do it faster, do it quicker, when's it coming back? But then after the first couple of weeks, it began to dawn on them that actually IT was their best friend. When they had no communications, because it was all VoIP, when they couldn't even send a message around to their very vast estate, um, because what they realized was sending bits of paper via fax with instructions, uh, if you don't date and time them, you counteract your own instructions. So it was a big learning curve for people who are not used to working in a, an environment without any technology. And she said, from that point on, we realized just how valuable our IT colleagues were. And from that point on, we realized it was our business that had failed. It was our citizens that we couldn't look after. And she's brilliant. She does a fantastic job. And that's what we need them to understand, in my opinion. Hmm. Okay, shall we have a look at the results of the earlier polls? Well, there's a, there are a few more questions, but I think um, we're nearing I'm okay the for end more of the time. I'm, Shall I, we ask I, more I, questions? I'll, okay. I'll stick, I'll stick around all night, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> okay. I, I've, been, I've been in the house once already, the kids are screaming, it's a nightmare in there, I'm, I'm safer <laughs> in here. I'm not, list, I'm not listening to your New York City cab driving uh, uh, hypotheses again. I've raised a question on that one. I want to dig into that one, but uh, oh, yeah, you, I'm happy you know, to keep you, going. You love it. You okay. love it All right. So Cheryl Tan has asked, what is the one thing you think would bring management to hear the engineers about likelihood per your example about the Challenger disaster? You could tell the story. I mean, that might help. Um, if you can, if you can, maybe, do you know what? I don't know, maybe a presentation like the one I did and maybe just talk about risk and talk about biases and talk about the issues. Because that, that that I feel is, because because of, as Andy and I have both said, we don't have the answers, but all I can do is try to spread awareness. And when you dig down and you look into the catastrophes that have happened, both from a cybersecurity perspective, well, within a cybersecurity perspective, you, 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 you straight away see the parallels with, with every other um, accident that's happened to, to do with poor decisions and poor choice making. I mean, even even if you consider, even when you boil it right down to code itself, you know, and, and programs themselves, I mean, the majority of the vulnerabilities within systems, if we just look at those, for example, um, are to do with bugs being left in. And I, and I have no problem with developers leaving bugs in because let's be honest about it. You know, it's 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 extremely difficult what they you know, what developers have to do. Incredibly challenging, you know hundreds and thousands, millions potentially of lines of code, all of which have to be secure and all of which have to work together in a secure way. Whereas an attacker only just has to find one error and you know one problem and, and, he, and he gets breached and the, and the developers may turn up a fall at some, uh, some hacker conference somewhere. Uh, very, very unfair. And that's a whole other discussion actually about making sure that, uh, that developers and uh, security professionals work together as a team and have a better, um, uh, a better uh, relationship. I mean, I no, mean the, I the, 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 sorry. Sorry, no, sorry, Andy, you go on. The, the, the oh, bit no, for no. me, because I, I, th I think that's a really good question, because um, what I've learned is sometimes it doesn't matter what I say. Uh, um, uh, what, what was really interesting is that lady who was the chief exec I just mentioned. Um, a chief exec listens to another chief exec, and sometimes it's got to be that kind of peer relationship for them to um identify and associate with it that there's still this whole thing of it's it's risk it's it's problem because unless it's happened to them um they 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 don't want to comprehend it um and because of that human bias means in order to function they they they're risk takers typically you know they live on their ego that's not a criticism that's you know these are people who have to make snap decisions so so they they filter out very quickly the, the, the other thing that I would say is it's very different. So what I've learned, again, as I was saying earlier, this model I've been sort of playing with and building on SAPSA and building some, you know, where actually what I say to them is how often do you want it breached and how bad do you want the breach? In the mm. fridge. Sorry, my son's gone to fetch me a beer. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. So, 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 so when you put it in those stark terms, they are horrified. Well, I, I want a system that's never going to be breached. Well, listen, I can I perhaps guarantee it's not going to be breached in three years. And in that three year cycle, we will continue to patch and update it. So we could probably start to keep pushing the three years away. But if you buy a system, even the greatest system today, and you don't do anything with it, 
it's going to get breached at some point because someone will discover a vulnerability in something and when you put it in those terms as i say it is horrific they 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 they, they you know they they don't like that but it's the reality and then when you start talking about do you want a catastrophic failure where we lose a million patient records or do you want to lose one how, how do you want to play it and putting it in those terms that they as a business really fear um uh, and in the nhs terms as david describes that is how many people do you want to die because that's I mean, the currency of the business we've had this conversation a few times um haven't we andy and i think one of the things uh which which you said to me once actually that resonated was that the people need to understand the impact it's going to have on them individually you know if, if we can make them feel responsible for a particular issue uh, it's difficult, isn't it? Because if something goes wrong now from a breach perspective, what 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 do most people in management will normally just blame it on IT or blame it on somebody else? But if we can if we can make them feel personally bought into a particular problem, that then, then maybe that might have a have an implication. If they if they're genuinely worried that that it might somehow affect them negatively, the the other thing as well, which I don't I, again I don't have an answer to, but I'm working on it, is um is is cybersecurity is enabler. If, if we can if we can string together the the, the right phrasing so that the the uh, management don't just think cybersecurity is going to cost them money they actually see a profit from it which of course there would be if they can if it makes their, their systems more efficient because often you get breached you don't know you're breached right there's there's information out there on the dark web about companies and they've got no idea that it's there the stuff that's being sold to their competitors and they've got no idea that it's happening you know uh a uh, uh, bp oil mining and their potentially their the, the the millions and billions of pounds of that money that they put into researching mining spots gets leaked to their competitors therefore saving that company millions of pounds and they don't even know that it's happening and i think this, this is a difference to their bottom sorry. line without even knowing that this is taking place so so, so it's that it's, it's that it's that it's that you know understanding Reputation. Mm. For me, again, David, I completely agree. It's that reputation thing. It's the MG Maestro, MG Montego. They had a reputation. It affected them. iPhones, why do people buy iPhones? One of the key considerations is because they're perceived as secure. Why do people buy a certain brand? Security can be an asset to a business. Uh, but the other thing is the question that was asked by someone earlier on was I thought was a brilliant question because actually there is a cost to security uh, and there's a cost to ethics and uh, information management and regulation and, and you're not telling me that some of the big businesses you know the the real huge businesses don't laugh when they get a 160 million pound fine they probably make 10 times that in the data that they've used inappropriately so every business makes a decision based on it back to the the business earlier on that you know if i if i get a little breach what is the cost of that if it cost me 10 times that cost to 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 fix the gap then business senses i won't do it if reputation isn't damaged those examples that were given earlier you know i mean i think i think the nhs brand suffered hugely to be honest because we're trying more and more to push people towards digitization to support them in managing their own care Care.data, which wasn't even a breach, it was more a information management ethical piece, has done untold damage. People don't trust them anymore. And we're still trying to recover from that. The WannaCry security thing still sticks in people's minds. The number one um, concern that uh, in Nottingham and Nottinghamshire during the sort of two, two and a half years research um, looking at um, you know public digital services was security. Number two was ethics. The information governance and sharing, the GDPR, DPA bit, didn't even come into number five. So, so that you know, the 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 impact of reputation can be significant. Um, you know, think of Google and and privacy. What comes first into your mind? Yeah, think of, I think you got some. Space. I think you got something in that, Andy. I, and I, I I would go along with that as well. If you can, you know, if you can, if you can convince of the financial implications um then 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 that's one way to go uh and then also i guess you know just just trying to um to spread the word in the way that that, that andy and i have tried to do today uh, about um you know getting making the right decisions and doing them with a uh, making intelligent choices okay well what do we want to do 
it's uh can we are we looking at the are the, we're going to look at the the polls that's uh polls i, I we just, look at the polls I had, okay i had this worry then for a moment that it was just david and i sitting here talking to each other um and <laughs> everybody else like, oh. <laughs> I, it's because i've thrown everybody off probably sorry about that <laughs> we bored okay, everybody so we, yeah so the first one that was what would you describe your um main job as is that one and that's interesting for me because I think, you know, architects, in, you know, it's, it's including cyber is, for me, I think is essential. Uh, I think, you know, if you're an architect, you, you should have, you should have at least oversight and, and control of the strategy in which, in which the architecture is being put together. I think if you leave that as a, you know, as an after or a, a separate piece of work, even then, 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 then for me, that's where I think maybe some of the gaps start to appear. Yeah. Um, okay. So should we look at the next one? Hang on. Why isn't that coming up? Oh, hide. Okay. Um, okay. Have you worked in an organisation? That one. I think that one quite quite demonstrates the point. Um, I love the know what's a vulnerability. Um, I, I, I do. I do love that one. Uh, and, and people have definitely got a sense of humour in that one. Um, I hope. I can't actually see the results. Can't you? They're all, con everybody's contending your New York City taxi driver uh, evidence. I, I just assume that they're useful and interesting. I can't see them. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I don't need to see them. Oh, I wonder what you're seeing. Maybe it's on a different screen for you. Can I? Can other people, if you raise your hand, if you can see the the poll results? Yeah, okay. I can see. It. I think it's right. maybe because we're still Just sharing you... David's screen. Uh, am I, do I need yeah. to unshare my screen? Is that without well, probably? Do it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Um. So. Again, I think I think fifty two percent recognizing that there are maybe some 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 gaps um, in the existing architecture frameworks. And I think that's fair. You know, I, I think th 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 those frameworks that I looked at are very open and honest that they're not they're not trying to be the sort of um, universal uh, answer to everything and anything. And I think because the world is changing so rapidly and because um of that development in terms of agility and approach and attacks uh, I, I think we just need to recognize that there are some gaps i would hope that those people who say that um that they that the architecture covers everything it, it, uh, are people in a certain sector of business um that's perhaps more akin to uh aligned to sort of um, those frameworks uh, addressing the risks and here's the last one. Yeah, I think I think seventy five percent people recognizing that there will be a breach, I think is for, for me is not a shock. I think that's that that shows the that shows the understanding of the professionals out there, and I think these are the people that need to be. Need to be heard a little bit more. Um, uh, the, the no, it will never happen. It'd be interesting just to understand. But you know, I suspect there's a certain business sector or certain things that that, that they are involved in that might be a little bit more um, specific. They honestly don't know. I, I can completely understand. Um, it, it's a tricky world, isn't it? Depending on what your context and environment is. I, I, I think the yes, it will happen um, is quite low. At, at... 75 in terms of my honest view on that um i think uh, i think everybody um has been and will be breached i think um the majority of the time they won't even know i asked the i asked a, an executive uh, board member um when the last time was uh, that they've been hacked quite recently um uh, and they said oh when was it 2017 was it want to cry and i said um how do you know 
the NCA had been compromised for 14 months before they realized, and that's the national, sorry, the uh, NSA, so the American National Security, what is it? National Security. I'd go with agency. <laughs> Agency. That's the word. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So they 14 months before they realized. So, the, I mean, the, j just to um, emphasize that point a little bit further, when we go out and do penetration tests or we do incident response, when we go out to look at an incident, we almost always find additional breaches that have happened as well as the one we've gone to investigate that have usually happened, you know, even many years before we see evidence of you know, uh, logs or activity that's taken place without the company understanding. And we see them on penetration tests, certainly more often than not. And the company had no idea. So, you know, just, just want to try and make that, that point as clear as I can anecdotally as well. Okay, I think that's all of the polls. So, I'm going to hand over to Chris Banks, who's going to I'm going to attempt to hand over to Chris. <laughs> Actually, he's, kick him out. he's just going to talk, yeah. You're not going okay. to kick him out like me, are you? No, no. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Only you, David. Only you. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Special. Yeah, okay. so Chris, you can just talk, I think, because you're already okay. presenting. All right, fabulous. So um, I think first up, really want to thank um, Andy, David, um, for just setting the scene today. Um, Andy you took us back in time to the caveman and the woolly mammoth, right? Um, through the 80s and the stuff that's more present day. And I think some of the analogies around sort of defense mechanisms of the human body and cyber and all of those sort of things, for me, really resonated. It was fabulous. Um, David, um, the insight that you provided around, I, I think, sort of, why people are sort of so stuck in their ways and um, why we failing to learn, right? Um, and some of those sort of cognitive bias and everything. I just saw everything was great. And everyone that's attended, I've been keeping an eye on the dashboard and um, we're like two and a half hours in and we've still got good attendance. Everyone's focused. So this is their front screen. So this is absolutely fabulous on a Wednesday night. Um, so credit to you guys for leading That's everyone. That's my entire for... family, by the way, Chris. Everybody I know uh, has dialed in, has got it on the screen. So I've got about 50 family members all backing me now. So I don't uh, want to disappoint rest... you, but, but the, that, the is the, that is the situation. The rest of them are mine. <laughs> so I, I thought we said no relatives. <laughs> <laughs> Without that, pal, I'd be a very lonely man. <laughs> but obviously, guys, it is awesome. And I think one of the things that David that you sort of shared at one point is was compliance and cybersecurity, right? It's just a tiny little thing. And I think the, the ripple effects can be far reaching and completely unknown. And the whole thing about people, it's the soft skills, the technical skills, and what it can actually result in. Um I, I think it really sort of set the scene. So if we look at sort of what the question was that we were trying to answer at the beginning, which was, are we wasting money on cyber controls? So um, I, I think there's been fabulous content, great questions. So thank you everyone for their contributions. Um, because I think really it sort of set the scene is by no, far, well, no means of the imagination, right? One size doesn't fit all. Um, and I think there's been fabulous context. So um, I think I'm just going to leave it to all the attendees to make their mind up, right? Are we wasting money on your on, on cyber controls? Um, every industry, every organization is different. Um, and I think Andy touched on some good stuff around frameworks and um, there's been some guidance that's been shared, which I think has been fabulous. Um, so hopefully we um, can build on some of that stuff we, we're going to be, uh, this is a boring part now where I've got to go on to some of the formal announcements. So um, Enterprise Architecture Specialist Group, we've got our AGM coming up in October on the 12th, and we're going to have more events um, just like this one. And people in the committee like Gabrielle and Sachin who have been helping out tonight and volunteering their time. Um, first up, you guys, thank you. 
Um, but there's a, t a committee team behind all of this that are pulling these events together and just really want to share this to help raise the professionalism of what you do, what we do, what um, some of our colleagues do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so please keep an eye out and stay connected. We've got some social media um, feeds on Twitter, LinkedIn. If you're not following or joining, please do. We'd love you to be part of that community that's starting to grow and starting to have inputs from all different people from all over the world now, which is fabulous. And we've got the web page, which is where we're going to be sharing the presentations from tonight, the recordings. And I just need to mention this uh, around the BCS. So there's this whole thing about the new beginnings and within the BCS are looking at new ways of doing things, um, which all of us are in like a new normal and a new you and the new things that happen at home now today, right? Everything's changed. So if you're interested in events, sharing information, connecting with other professionals, thinking about that continual professional development, check out the membership. It's pretty good value. Um, and, and so I've done the announcements bits, that's all done. So I think we're at the point where I just really want to thank everyone, speakers, Andy, David, Gabriella, um, Sachin for everything you've been doing um, throughout the event and everyone that's attended and your contributions and the questions that have really made the event what it is tonight. So we're now going to wrap this up, end it, stop recording, we're going to keep it open so if anyone wants to hang around yet this is going to be a first for us right we're going to attempt virtual networking so bear with us but if you're interested it'd be great to chat with you afterwards i am i'm going to go and grab a beer though i am same Sarah, can we have a five minute comfort break because uh, my fridge is calling me sure okay i'm going to stop the recording right now <laughs>